Good morning and welcome to High Point Online. My name is Erica. And I'm Amy. And we're so excited to have you here, whether you're a first time guest, which if you are, you are more than welcome to text HP Info to 97000. And if you're streaming from Atlanta or all the way across the country, we're so happy to have you with us again. Yeah, absolutely. So here's something. First of all, I haven't seen you in so long. It's this been, is so fun to like be back in the hosting spot with you, Erica. Have you been? <laughs> I've been good. I've been good. Even with this change of weather and everything, it's been... It's I feel been like awesome. my mood's been better this whole week because oh. the sun's been shining and the weather's been crisp. It's yes. been lovely. You've been throwing this nice little sweater. Yeah. Sweater weather again. Okay. Sweater weather. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, speaking of sweater weather, okay, we're heading into October, and one thing that we're doing as a church, um, heading into our next outdoor service, is we're actually going to start collecting canned good items. So, I brought some to show everybody, so you can bring a can of vegetables. Will you hold that for me, please? And also, hearty soups. That's right. You can bring a vegetable soup. I'm sorry, a beef stew, a chili, anything like that, and any canned vegetable. We're collecting these, and we're giving them to Must Ministries, which is a local food pantry here in um, the Kennesaw, Ackworth, Woodstock area. And so. when, are you asking, when you should bring these cans, it's to our next outdoor service, which is happening on October 11th. Yes. yes. October 11th at Swift Cantrell Park. You guys can bring your friends, bring your family, and bring your canned goods. Bring them, all right? Yes. And with that, I'm ready to head into worship. Let's go ahead and let's take a moment and pray. God, we just thank you so much for this day. God, we thank you for this season. God, even just the refreshing air, God, that we're breathing in right now. And Father, we just ask that you would just meet us where we are right now. God, wherever we're streaming from this morning, wherever we're sitting, wherever we're standing and listening and worshiping together, Lord, I pray that your presence would meet us exactly where we are. We thank you for this spiritual family. We thank you for the opportunity to worship together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
face Bright as the sun We'll bow before The King of Kings Oh God Good morning and welcome to High Point. My name is Andy. I'm the lead pastor here. Thrilled to be worshiping with you today. If it's your first time, let me just say it again. We are so pumped to have you here worshiping online with High Point. And uh, we're going to be jumping into things here in just a second. But before we do, you've heard it said, if you started service at the very beginning, you've heard it now a few times, pretty much everything that you need to get connected, to grow, to give, uh, it can be found by you texting HP Info to 97000, right? You can do that right now from your phone. And here's what I invite you to do. You can, you can literally continue your time of worship uh, through giving in this moment. And you can also get connected, sign up for life groups, know what's happening uh, in the life of the church. With that, we're going to jump right in. We're in a series called You Inc., The Art of Leading Yourself. There's never been a time in my years of living where we have needed the capacity to lead ourselves more than I've ever seen right now. We need leaders who can lead. And when I say we, not only do I mean the church, but I mean our communities, our cities, our homes, our neighborhoods, our workplaces. We are, we are void of great leadership. And so last week, this week, and in the coming weeks, we are trying to grow in Christ-like leadership so that you might know not only how to lead yourself, but that you might know how to lead others. So with that, we're going to go straight to it. Turn to Exodus chapter 32, verse 1. I'm going to read it, and then we're going to get straight into it. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron, and they said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. And, they sa and he said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. So in context, we have the, the Israelites who have experienced freedom from slavery. Uh, they've, been, they have, they've left Egypt. They're heading towards the promised land. And they've been out and about roughly 30, 40 days, right? And they're led to the base of this mountain where God invites Joshua and Moses up to receive the Ten Commandments. Moses takes a hike, right? And he is gone and absent for what the Israelites feel is a pretty long time. Right? They don't know where he is. It's been about 30 days. 
And so they begin to look at each other. They begin to panic. They begin to despair. Where's our leader? Where is the one who, who is, who's brought us out of Egypt? Where is, ultimately, the real question is, where is God in all of this? Where is he? And so they go to Aaron and they say, you, you need to deal with this. You need to make us a God so that we can worship. We are taking matters into our own hands and we need answers. We need results. And so Aaron... Literally, the, 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 the priest Aaron, he says, take off, take, off all, take off the jewelry, take off the earrings. Melts it into a golden calf, and he says, here is your God who has brought you up out of Israel. This is a crazy story. It's a very significant story in the life of Israel. And might I add, it is a pattern we see Israel recreating time and time again. And it's a pattern, if you're not careful, and I'm not careful, we'll emulate as well. Where is God? Where is the great and healthy leadership? And when I don't see things in the time frame that I want them, I'm going to take matters into my own hands. We don't like to wait. I'm going to think about this for a minute. There aren't many things where you're like, man, I would really enjoy waiting for that. We are not a culture. We're not a community. We're not a people that likes to wait. Companies invest millions and millions of dollars in creating ways to speed up the processes and systems for their organization. We have microwaves that have sped up the ability for you to get hot food. If you go to an amusement park like Six Flags or Disney World, people pay a premium for what? The fast pass. Because who wants to wait in a line? And if you grew up in the 80s like me, before the internet existed, and then you got the internet, right? Do you, even, do you even know what waiting feels like when you have to wait for dial-up to give you internet? Or I'm just going to give you an idea of what this feels like right now. Mm -hmm. You get the idea. That, that, first of all, that sound brings back so much beautiful <laughs> and painful memories. Now, you have a phone, and if you don't have internet access, in 0.2 seconds, literally a wireless signal that is sending uh, information to a satellite in outer space and then it is sending it right back to you. If you don't get it instantly, you're ready to hulk out on somebody. If you've ever seen a meme, you know, the meme that's like, you don't know your spouse until you've seen what they're like without reliable wireless internet. <laughs> it's, it's completely true because we are not a people that are accustomed to waiting. We don't like to wait. And yet, bear with me here, church. It is one of the greatest gifts and the art of leading yourself. You can, you can literally accomplish so much as a leader if you will learn the art of slowing down in the principle of waiting. Now, not just waiting in general. I want to, I want to be very clear in this moment because we're, we're talking about Christian leadership in this moment. But the ability for you to wait on God and for God to make your steps clear, for God to make the way, uh, the, the door open to affirm your steps. This is the kind of leadership we need. Not impulsive, not impatient, not the kind of leadership where we take things into our, our own hands to accomplish things in our own strength. So today I want to talk to you about three things. Three things right now uh, three mistakes leaders often make by not learning to wait. Number one, 
One of the greatest mistakes and snares that we can make as leaders is idolizing results. We idolize results. Look at what Aaron is dealing with here. Aaron, Aaron is a great leader in the Bible, okay? Don't, don't, he makes a lot of mistakes, but make no mistake about it. God uses him in powerful ways. God shows him for leadership, and he walks alongside Moses in, in, in literally the deliverance of, Egypt, of Israel from Egypt. Bear with me here. Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. This is after the, the people are growing impatient. They're, getting, they're, they're beginning to panic. But where did those gold earrings come from? Where's that jewelry from? We, we, we miss this in the Bible. When the Israelites are leaving Egypt, they've been slaves for 400 years. One of the things that God promises them as they're being faithful and as they're being obedient, He grants them favor. And the very people who have enslaved them are now giving them gold and jewelry and blessing them. God's favor is upon them and it shows up in blessing. But oftentimes, when, when, we, when we grow impatient and we grow frustrated and we don't know where God is, the very thing that God has used to bless us is now the very thing that we use to try to draw life from. In, in other words, the blesser is the one who we're supposed to be worshiping. But oftentimes, in our despair and panic, we begin to worship the blessing. We idolize it. We idolize results. We idolize answers. And so the very thing that was God's favor upon them is now the thing that they melt down, turn into a calf, and begin to worship. And they declare, this is what brought us out of Egypt. That is not what brought them out of Egypt. The results didn't bring them anywhere. The answers didn't bring them anywhere. God brought them somewhere. He brought them to freedom. It was all about Him. And now the very person, right? The very personhood of God that they're to be worshiping, they've replaced with His blessing and favor, earrings and jewelry, etc. It's easy to do this. It's easy to lead in such a way where we idolize results and we idolize answers. You know what, even as I'm, even as I'm beginning to transition, th th this is worth noting. Aaron needed to wait. But Aaron didn't have answers. He didn't have results. He didn't have anything to show except teaching the people in this moment what it looks like to wait on God. And to wait for Moses. You see, leaders that wait are oftentimes mistaken for being incompetent. And this is where you have to be secure as a leader. Leaders that wait oftentimes are, are confused for being faithless, for being incompetent, because we are a people that want results. Faith should produce action, and it should produce, it should produce works. But we, we, we misunderstand what the Scriptures are teaching us in this moment. I'll give you a great example uh, right now in my own life. Here we are as a church. We're in the midst of coronavirus. We're in the midst of, yes, still a pandemic that's impacting the world. And I will tell you what I want to see happen. I want a building. I want a place to worship. I want to know all the answers as it pertains to, uh, you know, uh, the dangers of the virus and how to make people feel safe. I want all of these things. But I have news for you. Even though I try to stay abreast on as much information as I can, I am not a molecular biologist. And I don't know all that God is doing in this moment. I could force us into a, a building or force us into a lease. Our team could, could act impulsively and we could act out of panic or despair. And the reality is people might end up leaving. That is a reality that churches are facing right now. I know that. 
But you know what kind of pastor and leader and leadership team we're going to be at this church? We're going to be the kind of team that waits for God to make things clear. I want you to know that we have had facilities available to us that are like 45 minutes away. And initially, I'm like, oh, yes, that'd be great. But it doesn't make sense. That would be an impulsive move. Trying to move our church 45 minutes from its current location, would it make sense? No, it wouldn't. It would be knee-jerk. It would be reactionary. When what God would have us do is wait, be prayerful, be faithful, be patient. Wait on God. He will order our steps. This is what godly and great leadership does. The second thing that we oftentimes do, a, a, a mistake that we, that we make, is that we idolize the past. Don't we? When you're going through a hard time, especially when you're going through a hard time, don't you look back and you, and you think the golden years. Oh, the good old times. Those were the days. Right? And we think about all of these moments. And, and hear me, it's great to have fun, celebratory things that are in your past. I have, a, I have a crate filled with rocks in my office that has testimonies of people who, who've literally written down what God has done in their life. And every once in a while, I'll, I'll take one of those rocks and I'm reminded of what God has done throughout the history of our church. It's a helpful reminder for me. But understand something also. Uh, there is a tendency to romanticize the past, to glorify the past, and to make it something that it actually wasn't quite. So, I, I, growing up you know, in St. Louis, behind my house was this big field. It was called the common ground. And my dad would go out there and he would hit golf balls. What felt like a mile to me as a kid. And all the neighborhood kids would go out in the field and we would play baseball. And I mean, we had the dime, we had it all set. And then beyond the, the, the baseball was, the, was a woods and there was a giant hill. I mean, we're talking a huge field, giant hill, golf balls, baseballs, the whole nine yards. And I was so excited to, you know, to show some of my family when I was in town, you know, life as I grew up. And I pulled up to the house, my old house, the house I grew up in. And I peeked into the back field. And I literally looked at it. I looked at my sister and I was like, what the? This field is so small. Right? That hill is tiny. This is not a big hill. And everything that I had, I had thought as a kid, because as a child, and it was just big. I discovered my dad was not using a driver to drive golf balls. You know what he was using? A pitching wedge, right? The smallest golf club for hitting, a, for hitting a golf ball. But to me as a kid, he was launching golf balls into outer space, right? And, but this is what we do. We romanticize the past. Look what, look what happens in Numbers 21. Uh, the Israelites traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom, but the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses, and they said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no bread, there's no water, and we detest this miserable food. Our pets' heads are falling off. Right? little Dumb and Dumber reference? That just happened. So Israel, you, you remember this. They have been given their freedom. Yes, they're in a place of hardship, but they are literally looking back on 400 years of slavery that they were crying out for deliverance from. And they're literally looking at Moses and they're saying, why did you do this to us? As if... Life was so much better back then and back there. And we see this language from them time and time again because they quickly forget what God has done. And if you're so focused on, 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 on the past, you're going to miss what God is trying to do right now. I'm not saying don't celebrate what God did. But there's a tendency at times for us to almost live 
on a word from God. We live on a moment, an encounter that we had with God, and we'll live on it for five years, right? It's the thing you just always think back to that, the church over here that, you know, that one time, right? Or that one sermon that you heard, you know, nine years ago. And all of that is good and it has a place. But you know when, when you, get, you get stuck living in a ministry moment or living in a God-sized moment back then and you forget to be hungry and desperate and pursuant of God moving right here, right now. Now, God has something fresh for you right now. And godly leaders know how to wait for it without over romanticizing and glorifying the past. I'm not called to live back there. I'm called to live right here, use my faith right here, and be hungry for God to move right here. Your waiting season is not a wasted season. Do not forget this. You might be called to wait, but in the waiting, God is doing a mighty work, not only inside of you, but the people that you are called to lead. Don't forget it. Don't idolize the past. Celebrate the past. Be thankful for what God did then, but be hungry and desperate for Him right here and right now. The third thing uh, that we oftentimes do, not only do we idolize uh, results, we idolize the past, but we idolize excuses. Excuses. All you have to do is have a child to know that this is true. (laughs) Excuses have a way of creeping up as to why you cannot be faithful. Right? Why you cannot obey. It's because this happened, Dad. Dad, it's because of this. I, I couldn't do anything about it. Right? Uh, listen to this in Exodus 32, 24. So I told them, whoever has any gold jewelry, take it off. This is Aaron speaking. Let me back it up. Aaron is, is giving an account to Moses on, as to how this happened with the golden calf. He says, I told them, whoever has any gold jewelry, take it off. Then they gave me the gold, and I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. Do do you realize the lunacy of this? Aaron is shirking responsibility here. He crafted this calf, right? They sculpted this calf. They made a mold for this calf. He didn't just accidentally, you know, kind of ask for some jewelry, drop it in the fire, and oh my gosh, look at this beautiful golden calf that came out. I guess we should worship it. No. That is an excuse. And when we are sick and tired of waiting for God to move and we take matters into our own hands and we start making decisions that are wrong, decisions that are contrary to the Spirit of God and what He would have us do, and then we get called to task on it. We get called to carpet on it. It's easy to all of a sudden begin to, to, to produce excuses and we exalt those excuses literally above the very Word of God and obeying Him. Obeying Him as leaders. The greatest leaders know how to be faithful and obey God through the difficult times. Not just when it's easy. I want you to hear that great leaders know how to obey God through the difficult times and to stay faithful through it. I'm not saying it's always easy. It's hard. There are difficult times. But thank Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins that you and I might have life. When he stepped out of the grave and he vanquished death and he conquered sin, he promised the disciples something. He said, I'm going to be returning to my Father in heaven and when I do, I'm going to give you a helper. And that helper we call the Holy Spirit. And in times of difficulty, not only times of difficulty, but times even when times are great. The Holy Spirit comes and works inside of you, gives you strength, gives you wisdom. But you have to be the kind of leader who is hungry for God to speak and minister to you in this way. 
That you have to be willing to wait for the very Spirit of God to bring you strength and bring you comfort. God is not a a slot machine. And there are times where you have to wait for Him. Don't idolize the past. Don't idolize excuses. Don't idolize results. Exalt Jesus Christ to the place that only He can truly exist in. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is King over it all. And we need leaders who wrestle with that, who deal with that in their own hearts and are willing to wait for this King and this Lord to clarify the decisions that have to be made. You have to wait for Him. You have to wait. You might have to wait for clarity in a relationship. You might need to wait for clarity for for God to move in your job or something in your family. Some of you are praying literally for your kids and, and, and the results that you're asking for, it hasn't happened yet. Keep praying. Continue being faithful and wait on God. Some of you haven't had the breakthrough that you wanted so desperately, vocationally. Keep praying. Keep seeking and wait for Him. Don't just panic and despair and take matters into your own hands. Yes, you need to act. Yes, you need to be faithful. But there are many times where the only right response is for you to take a deep breath and trust Him and have faith and wait. Great leaders know how to wait. Joshua 23 Verse 2 and verse 14. After a long time had passed and the Lord had given Israel rest from all their enemies, Joshua, by then a very old man, Joshua is now leading Israel, not Moses, it's Joshua. He summons all Israel, their elders, leaders, judges, and officials, and he said to them, I'm very old. Now I'm about to go the way of all the earth. He knows he's about to die. Joshua understood the art of waiting on God. And it was in the waiting that he learned what it looks like to lean into the promises of God, to understand His faithfulness, that God hasn't dropped the ball, that God hasn't forgotten, that God hasn't missed it on any of the things that He has promised you, that He's promised me. And Joshua is exhorting the elders, the leaders, the people of Israel, and now it's my turn to exhort you, wherever you're watching from, whether you're here in Kennesaw and in Atlanta, outside the perimeter or inside the perimeter, whether you live in the state of Georgia or whether you live in a different country, you need to be reminded that the God that we serve hasn't forgotten and hasn't missed, hasn't messed up on any of His promises. In fact, the fulfillment of every amazing promise that God has made to you and me is met through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, who lived a perfect life, the life that you and I could not live for ourselves. He took our sin upon Himself, literally went to the cross, and died the death that we deserved for our sin. But because He was perfect, and because He was perfectly faithful, He rose from the grave because sin had no hold on Him. And He offers life to those who would literally simply put their faith in Him. An invitation for you and I now to use our faith to be faithful. And all the things that we see in the Old Testament and all the things we see in the New Testament are met and satisfied and fulfilled. How? Through Jesus Christ. God has and will always be faithful. And He does it through Jesus. When Jesus went to the cross and He died again and died and rose again, He gives the Holy Spirit to every single person who would believe and put their faith in Him. And now you're reminded by the Spirit of God of the truth of God. But you've got to be the kind of person who will reject idolizing the past, who will reject idolizing results and reject excuses and wait on God and be hungry for Him and pursue Him. 
Look at some of the promises are that you and I get to remind ourselves in the difficult moments. Maybe a moment that you're in literally right now. God's not done. God will sustain you. God's peace will guard your heart. God delights over you with singing. He delights in you. These are all promises in the scripture. That God will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. That God is your refuge and strength, your help in times of need. In all things, you are more than a conqueror because God loves you. God will never leave you. God will never forsake you. God's perfect love casts out all fear. Nothing can separate you from God's love. God's not finished. God's not done. But there are times where you have to learn to wait on Him. And that might be right where you're at right now. And I want you to be reminded that if you're in your waiting, it's not wasted. Your waiting season, it's not a wasted season. It's a time for you to be reminded of God's faithfulness. Pursue Him with everything you've got. Father, I thank you in this moment that you are reminding us of how good you are and how great and faithful you are. And Lord, there are times where we want to make excuses for not following you or not obeying you. God, there are times where we just, we're not hungry for you to move now. We'd rather just, we'd rather just live on something we experienced five years ago. God, are we idolize results and answers rather than just learning to wait and trust you? God, I thank you, Lord, that this is a relationship with you. Teach us, shape us, draw us into deeper relationship with you today. Help us to be the kind of people who lead not only others but ourselves with patience, with grace, and the ability to wait on you. Lord, we love and worship you. Amen. Amen. High Point family, it's great to be here with you today. So thankful that you tuned in today. I hope this encourages you, and I hope you're blessed today. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday. that we just heard from Pastor Andy, just leading us into our second week of this new series that we have. Yeah, I know. I love learning and talking about even just the idea of waiting, that our time isn't wasted in the waiting. And yeah. um, I know that encouraged me. I hope that encouraged all of you out there this morning. And um, yeah, if you need any prayer or anything that we can do to follow up with you, don't forget to text HPM photo 97,000. Yeah. You can go to our website. We have people waiting and ready to talk to you this morning to pray with you. Yes, and with that, I will also bring up the point that we have life groups that are launching off this coming October. Yes! And if you want to get more information about that, like Amy already said, you can text HP Info to 97,000 and all the information about life groups, whether you're a kid or an adult, they're there for you. They're there. And we have a special group that's launching for the first time, our Essentials group. So if you're new to faith or you're trying to grow, just even understanding the basics, the foundations of faith, that is the group for you. It's awesome. Do you have your group? I ready? do. I what, do. What, what's your group? The Young Professionals. Young Professionals. Oh, yeah. Okay. Of course. We have our Monday night group. We have a family group. But you don't have to have a family to be in our group. So true. Anybody. Yeah. So anyways, also I just want to remind everyone to not go anywhere. Mm -hmm. Don't leave. There's a link mm -hmm. on your screen. We are going to have a block party, okay? A block party right now yep. together mm -hmm. as a family. Amen. We're having a block party. So wait, click on that link. And what we mean by block party is we're basically just having a time where we're connecting over Zoom right here after service. Yes. So we look forward to seeing you there. And with that, I think it's time to go. Y'all yep. have a good week. Bye, guys. If you're a first time guest with us, go ahead and let us know that you're a first time guest with us today by, I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> Here. Camouflage. Oh, man, it is camouflage.